Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. The horrific afterlife of Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette was the Queen of France through her marriage to King Louis XVI. She had been sentenced to death after being found guilty of treason, among other things, and she spent her last days in captivity as a widow. Her execution saw her lose her head under the guillotine, and a death mask was cast by the infamous Madame Tussaud. But for 22 years, Marie lay in an unmarked grave, alone and lost. Entering the mist of these shadows, of which I am now a part, I was long in search for my face. The habit of having a body whose presence made me notice made it infinitely dear to me, especially since, like almost all pretty women, I had spent my life caring for and perfume it. But soon I realised that everything being intellectual in this aerial world, everything that could affect the senses, became absolutely useless. This was taken from a lament in an anonymous dialogue of the dead, in which five women who were all guillotined within a seven-year period featured, with passages of conversation in the hereafter. It comments on their lives and the changes that have been made since their passing. It gives a voice to those who had no voice, and were executed all in the same manner. One of these women was Marie Antoinette. But this book was not the only afterlife that Marie experienced. The one I'm going to talk about today is far more tragic. Marie Antoinette was the Queen of France through her marriage to King Louis XVI, sentenced to death for being found guilty of treason. She spent her last days alone in captivity as a widow. Her husband had been executed via guillotine a while before, and Marie was now no longer queen and was as such referenced to as Widow Capet. Capet was the name of the French royal house that her husband descended from, and at the age of 37, Marie was now looking back on the deterioration of her health and the trauma and grief that followed the beginning of the French Revolution. Marie was now thin, and she appeared older than her years with white hair and dressed in black and white plain clothing. She had suffered greatly. Her husband had been killed. Her eldest son and heir had died at the beginning of the revolution from tuberculosis, and one of her daughters had died in infancy, leaving Marie with two children. They were all she had left in the world, a son and a daughter, Louis Charles and Marie Therese. This left Marie in a state of deep melancholy, and, to make matters worse, Marie's son, Louis Charles, was taken from her and then Marie was taken away from her daughter and left all alone in the conciergerie. Marie Antoinette was then taken to her trial, something that lasted two days and resulted in a guilty verdict of treason, the punishment, death via execution on the guillotine. Prior to her trial, what would happen to Marie had been debated. Some thought she should be exiled, but others, and only by a small winning vote, decided that death of all of those involved with the royal family should be killed. So Marie's fate was sealed. She then composed her testament and last words on the 16th of October 1793 and wrote, I have just been condemned to death, not to a shameful death that can only be for criminals. I am calm, as people are whose conscience is clear, my deepest regret is having to abandon our poor children. I only lived for them. October 16th was also the day the former Queen of France died. In the morning she was attended on by her maid at 7am and she found Marie to be lying on her bed, her face in her hands and facing the window. Marie only had a few mouthfuls of broth but other than that she declined all other foods. She was then forced to change into a white dress under the eye of the guards and then was attended on by the executioner. He came and used scissors to cut her hair before Marie then mocked up a bonnet to cover her head. She then had her hands tied tightly behind her back and then, by 11am, her final journey began. A cart had been sourced to ferry Marie from her place of imprisonment to her death. 
Finally, the procession reached the Place de la Concorde. Marie Antoinette had to endure jibes and insults from the crowd, but she had become immune to this after her time in prison, and she held her head high. Some onlookers described her as a dignified figure, whilst her enemies accused her of being arrogant. Once at the scaffold, Marie climbed the stairs and accidentally stood on the foot of her executioner. She apologised and her final words to him were, I did not do it on purpose. Then, within fifteen minutes, Marie Antoinette's head had been taken clean off and the next twenty-two years of her afterlife were far from peaceful. Marie Antoinette's head and body were taken to an unmarked grave at the Madeleine Cemetery. Madame Tussaud managed to sneak into the cemetery when the grave diggers were on a break and took a wax sculpture of Marie Antoinette's face. It's believed that her body and head had been left unattended on the grass next to her grave. After her execution... Marie Antoinette became a symbol abroad and a controversial figure of the French Revolution. Some used her as a scapegoat to blame for the events of the Revolution, and in 1821 Thomas Jefferson wrote, Her inordinate gambling and dissipations with those of the Count de Troyes and the others of her clique had been sensible item in the exhaustion of the treasury which called into action the reforming hand of the nation and her opposition to it. Her inflexible perseverance and dauntless spirit led her to the guillotine, adding that, I have ever believed, had there been no queen, there would have been no revolution. The cemetery where Marie Antoinette was buried was also where her husband, King Louis XVI, was buried and just two years later, the cemetery was then shut down as it had reached its capacity. Subsequently, the land was sold, and after some excavations that broke the two-year moratorium, the land in 1802 found its way to Pierre Louis Oliver Descalo. Now, Pierre owned the adjacent property, and he immediately took it upon himself to become the custodian of the royal remains. He became a pivotal figure in the exhumation of the king and queen, and through the years, the preservation of the site had lots of care and attention, and the site became a shrine and a site of pilgrimage. The walls were restored and raised, and the entrance was closed up, with the only access through his private garden. Turf was laid, and an orchard was planted marking the alleyways of the old burial ground with trees. The spot where the royal remains were said to be was separated by a hedge. Willows were planted and a small hillock was thrown up, surmounted by a cross. In 1814, a printed guide was published to the sacred place and it listed 1,343 individuals executed under the terror and now presumed to be buried in the cemetery. Pierre added a certificate of authenticity, and he signed it himself as a proprietor. He reminded his readers that the cemetery contained the relics of St Louis II, and invited them back to his house to view a detailed plan of locations. The royal graves were home to some beautiful flowers, and as a sign of fidelity, Pierre and his family sent the royal family every year some of the flowers. Now, after the restoration of the monarchy, Duchess de Anglum became a frequent visitor. She's noted as telling Pierre, I did not expect to find such faithful Frenchmen. Good old man, you have religiously preserved the ashes of my parents. Your family will be blessed. Now, it is debated as to if Pierre himself was the instigator of the exhumation process and if he deliberately sold his land at a profit, but a letter dated the 15th of January 1815. Pierre complains to the king that he has not been informed of the plans, which included demolition of the cemetery wall, and he asked whether Louis intended to acquire the land and requests a place in the cortege for himself and his family. In the event, Pierre was generously treated. He was given an honoured place in the proceedings and received 60,000 francs in compensation as well as a pension of 8,000 francs. 
On her last visit to the cemetery, the Duchess was accompanied by Monsieur the Comte de Artois, who took off his cordon of the Order of St. Michael and presented it to Pierre as a token of the King's gratitude. In the May of 1814, Louis XVIII instigated an official inquiry with the Chancellor d'Ambray as to the possibility of locating the bodies of his brother and his sister-in-law, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Testimonies were heard and those who were present at the burials were also heard from. Then, on the 18th of January 1815, the exhumation began. After 22 years in an unmarked grave, Marie Antoinette was found, and just one day later, so was the remains of King Louis XVI, and then it was decreed that on the 21st of the same month they would be transferred to St Denis on the anniversary of the King's execution. It was found that the Queen's grave had been covered in quicklime. However, this also created a solid barrier. It did preserve her remains to some degree. A number of bones had been found, and her skull, which is remarked as being found in a relatively intact state, was also found. Workers also uncovered a woman's stocking, two elastic garters and some hair, all thought to have belonged to the Queen. All the personal belongings were placed into a chest, and Marie's remains, what they could gather, were then placed into a second chest, along with earth and quicklime. These chests were then placed into the saloon of Pierre. A priest then spent the night in prayer within the king's chapel. The gates were locked and a guard was stationed on the grounds. It was then the following day that the search resumed for her husband. A trench was dug by the walls and soon the workmen noticed earth mixed with quicklime and the remnants of coffin boards. No clothing or belongings were found, but the skeleton resembled that of a man, and his head, just as described, was placed in between his legs. All those present were certain that this was the remains of the executed king. All the remains were carefully collected and placed into a chest. Both Marie and Louis's remains were then placed into lead coffins, and then early morning on January 21st, the regiments of Paris turned out to form a double line from the Rue de Anjou to St. Denis. At eight o'clock, Monsieur, accompanied by the Duke de la Anglume from the Tuileries to the cemetery, where they laid the first stone of the chapel on the spot where the royal remains had been discovered. Marie Antoinette was then finally laid to rest beside her husband, with other French royalty, within the walls of the Basilica of St. Denis in Paris. Although the remains of Marie and her husband are not 100% confirmed to be them, it is nice to think that they were found and then placed together in the safety and tranquillity of St. Denis so that they can both finally enjoy the peace of eternity. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.